everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about commercial success with data science, and I know what a lot of you are thinking. Who's that delusional guy who puts commercial success and data science into one sentence? So, um, I'm Jan. Um, I'm a data scientist by profession, um, and also a techie geek and innovator with a lot of passion. Um, as far as my bragging rights go and why I'm here on stage, I, I had a successful startup, um, co-founded it, sold it to Hitachi, and it's now the biggest utility comparison website in Japan. Um, I'm a smart cookie. I got myself tested. They gave me a PhD for it. Um, and at the moment, I'm leading data science at Supla. Supla is the property portal you hopefully all are using to find your um, um, next property. Um, I do have a lot of content on Medium, and I mean, this talk is going to be very light, um, so you can find much more detail um, in my articles there. So, what's wrong with data science? Um, let's have a look at Exhibit A, the stereotypic um, data scientist of the enterprise. There's a, there's a massive difference between what data scientists could and should do to add value, what usually a lot of managers think, how they should do that and achieve that, and the kind of reality of our day-to-day. -day. Um, so that's, that's not great. Um, and I can back that up um, with some numbers, I mean, because we're data people. So uh, when we look at um, New Vantage, which published a survey at the beginning of this year, they interviewed um, different companies, and 77% of them reported that they have challenges with business adaptation. Their data scientists were working, right? It's not that they didn't do anything, which that basically translates to is that Three quarters of all that data science projects are just collecting dust and don't get used. It's not great. Um, when we look at Gartner, they were never really um, big data science um, um, cheerleaders. Um, 2017, they were basically finding that 85% of all big data projects, back then it was still big data, don't really move past the kind of discovery phase. And when we look at them now, they didn't really get more cheerful um, with another survey um, published um, at the beginning of this year, um, and they found that 80% of analytics, I mean, we're talking about analytics insights, will not actually deliver any business outcomes through 2022. I mean, what kind of hope is there for data science? So if, if we summarize that, then Making data science a success is, for some reason, really, really hard. Um, you might say, well, why do I care? I'm getting paid regardless. Yes, I guess that's correct. It's, it's good to be a data scientist. <laughs> but exhibit B, why should we care? Um, you all probably have seen the hype cycle at some point, and I don't need to tell you where we currently are. We had that peak of visibility. I mean, we are even in the mass media now, not always for the right reasons, but with that visibility comes that peak of inflated expectations. We all know that. And with that current success rate of delivering value for businesses, we know where we go next. So basically why you should care is because do you want to be part of that reinvestment um, phase which comes after the next crash and AI winter? If you want to be part of that reinvestment phase, then we, could, um, we really have to start to look at the key requirements of making data science successful. Um, where, I, where I see it, you can basically break the success requirements for data science into like five themes. Um, one is around the motivation, um, which is all the difference between whether you just have another vanity project or is that actually a data science team or project aligned with business strategy. And there's like a lot of importance on the senior leadership buy-in, etc. Um, there are clear preparations and requirements before you should start hiring data scientists, and that will make the difference whether there are solid foundations for them to work with, or you just have a lot of um, duct tape and firefighting. And, you know, it's like all about the kind of data infrastructure, for example, which should be in place. Um, the other thing is your hiring process. Is that actually fit for purpose? Do you 
Do you find data science unicorns or just a lot of expensive mishires? And this is really important. I mean, believe it or not, I've been in interviews and they decided not to hire me and they've hired someone else. I mean, ridiculous when you think about it. And, <laughs> you know, and then obviously there's delivery. Um, you know, if you don't have a plan to deliver your models to production, you know, then you don't have models in production. You will have models on laptops, and that's not going to really deliver value. And then you have the retention side, which is all the difference between like a roadmap of game-changing projects or you have an abundant team within the next 12 months. Um, there's a lot of kind of material on a lot of these topics, um, in particular the importance of culture, etc. Um, what I'm very passionate about is the delivery box. And you might think, well, this is a human-centric um, conference. Why do I tick the, um, pick the most technical of all these topics? Bear with me. You will see that solving the technical challenges around delivering data science is the most humane thing you can do for your data scientists and will strongly correlate with the retention of your team long term. So when you go out and you ask people why data science is such a challenge, um, in particular in delivering value, um, a lot of people will tell you something about this 80-20 rule, which came from some survey in 2016, and it found that 80% of data science is finding, cleaning, and preparing data. Um, that's correct. Um, they also found that 60% of these data scientists didn't enjoy that part of their job at all. So you can understand why this became almost like a universal problem statement for data science. But when we look at, you know, where, why, why it became so popular, and we look at, like, this is the cross-industrial standard process for data mining from 1996. I like that one because it predates data science as we know it today, but it's a perfect data science workflow, right? Um, I had to make some updates because some things have changed. I mean, we now have more data silos in the middle than in 1996, and the importance of that data preparation step got much, much more important and time-consuming, so you can understand why there was a tendency to, to basically accept that as a problem statement for data science. Um, I realized I wasn't really done with my updates. I had to do some more because that data is usually on fire. Um, I don't know, at least in my team, there's a lot of angry language coming from the people who have to um, work with that data. And personally, when I look at that very innocent deployment box, then I can only laugh because I mean, at the risk of becoming a meme, you know, you do not just deploy data science, you know? And yes, there are platforms that not just promise, but deliver you one-click deployment, but you can't just deploy data science. Why is that? Well, because if you take one thing away from this entire presentation, then it's that productionization of models is the toughest problem in data science. It's not just deployment. Um, to give that a little bit of flavor, this is what the actual full um, life cycle of a um, data science project looks like. Um, a model in production is alive. It has a complex life cycle. Um, these models constantly need to be monitored and evaluated because models drift, and then you need to retrain them, and then you monitor them, and then you retrain them, etc. So you have this living, breathing beast in production. It's not static. It's not software. Um, and that makes all the difference. So. You're not really done there because very soon your um, data scientists will build you a challenger model and you suddenly have two of these beasts, which means you can't just solve it once. You have to find ways to already scale it because now you have to handle two of these um, models with life cycles, um, running them and potentially in parallel or evaluate them in parallel to make a decision, you know, which model you want to use. Um, businesses tend to... Um, look at traditional A-B testing to, to assess such an um, situation, um, assuming that you have some kind of um, smart traffic splitter, you just send 10% of your customers or traffic um, to your challenger model. But actually the question, how do you compare these models and the output from these models is extremely challenging. Imagine that's a recommendation engine. The result is personalized, you know? So how do I compare what one model says for you with what another model says for me? This is not actually that easy. And there's another thing. I mean, 
you assume that your challenger model is actually better, you know, but a lot of cases it might look like that, you know, and what you've just done is just to find out that your model isn't actually that great, you had to expose 10% of your customers to a terrible experience, and if they're not angry, one of your managers will be who looks after a KPI you just destroyed. So obviously not a great way to really assess challenger models, um, in particular not at scale, so there need to be better ways to do that. I'm afraid that's still not the full um, end of, th of the problem because the reality is something along that lines. Um, it's an entire zoo of um, languages, frameworks, and I mean, I have to probably add icons on a daily basis to that slide deck if I wanted to keep it up to date. And managing that in production gives every IT department a proper run for their money. Um, so really tough, and that's why you don't see much um, value being created because moving that into production is really, really hard. Um, I don't want to just give you problems, I also want to give you some value. So let's start with an actual full list of requirements you have to look for if you want to find a solution to data science and production at scale. We talk about this is not just a value add to your existing business model, but you have an appetite to make data science the core and center of your business. You need something which evaluates big numbers of models in parallel. Um, you need to manage that model life cycle. You need to handle that increasing complexity of the data science landscape. Um, you need to allow experimentation in production without impacting the user experience and decouple the business objective of delivering a stable, reliable customer experience from your data science objectives to play around with them and experiment with them. You also need to look at decoupling enterprise requirements like authentication, SLAs, GDPR from data science. You don't want to push that into data science, um, science models. And if you like um, Supply, you have to scale that to a peak of 50,000 or more page loads per minute without hiring armies of DevOps engineers to keep that all running. How do you do that? Well, there are a few kind of emerging solutions. The one I champion personally a lot is called Rendezvous Architecture. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. This is not my idea. It was published um, as a white paper um, by Ted Dunning and Alan Friedman, um, personal heroes of mine, um, very clever people. And they wrote about rendezvous architecture as a pattern, and it kind of opened my eyes and was like, of course, that's how you do it. So I sat down and tried to implement it. Um, at the, at the co um, core of their idea is we treat input data as a stream. So when we have requests coming into your models, you publish them onto a message stream, and we can use a PubSub messaging system to subscribe, um, subscribe models to that input stream, which means we already solved for easily distributing requests and evaluate a really big number of models in parallel. Um, simple as that. Um, obviously, the challenge is you now have all these scores being produced by your models. You still need to form a response. So you need to find something to pick something to send it back to, um, to, um, to the request. And they basically said, well, treat your scores as a stream, which means now all the models publish their scores onto a message stream. And the name giving rendezvous process is listening or subscribing as well as to the scores from the models as well to the input data. Why would you do that? Um, because you just decoupled the um, ability to respond to a request from the models ever producing a score. If all your models go down, God forbid, you know, <laughs> that can happen, um, and they never produce a score, the rendezvous process saw the request coming in, which means you can implement an SLA or a race condition or any kind of complicated policy around selecting scores, and this gives you huge power and actually allows you to implement a lot of the kind of risk mediation um, um, you want when you go into experimenting with your production um, data streams. Um, I mean, policies could be, you know, you wait for 200 milliseconds because that's acceptable, and if you're um, if your um, production model produces a score, you send that, otherwise a meaningful default, etc. 
Obviously, this is just like what the white paper suggested, translating that into a full-blown architecture for a business, it gets more complex. And obviously, I don't have time to really go through all of that, um, but I wrote an article about it. And there are challenges around, like, yes, some, it's a, basically it's a microservice architecture, some models are stateful, you can solve that. Um, but I'm afraid um, for reasons of um, time, I have to like, point you to that article which goes into the technical details of, of the implementation we've done at Zoopla. Um, Right now, I'll just take my word for it that when we look at the original requirements we had, evaluate models in parallel, well, PubSub messaging systems allow you to do that easily. Model lifecycle management, um, well, we decoupled models, we can put them on, in containers on Kubernetes with operators to implement our data ops APIs. Um, I, um, when you look at the article, you see how we use canary models, etc. Um, the complexity of, of the data science landscape, we just containerized it so your IT department doesn't care about that any longer. Um, experimentation in production, the rendezvous pattern allows you to do shadow scoring, something which is very common in banking, um, and they've done that for many, many years. Um, it is a form of risk mediation of untested models in production. Um, we also decouple the enterprise requirements because of the rendezvous pattern. We can have independent policies for SLAs and security. Um, and we can scale that easily because it's, a, it's, it's composed of stateless microservices. You can have that on Kubernetes. Um, so scale is not a problem. So nothing is for free, I'm afraid. Um, there is a cost to pay for, for building out a rendezvous architecture around models, and that's time. Um, so my implementation is, is basically producing an overhead of 40 milliseconds, sometimes 50. Um, engineers tell me that there is room for improvement. Um, it's just a question of prioritization that these engineers start working on my problems. But, for Supla, 40, 50 milliseconds is perfectly acceptable. Um, if users interact with our website, um, paying an overhead of 40, 50 milliseconds still gives you plenty of time to do data science and score um, um, propensities, etc., for personalization on the website. So, going back to what I promised you, you know, that's a very technical problem, as you saw, nothing in that requirements was a scientific problem, it was all technology um, requirements. Um, but there is a really important link between a scalable delivery pipeline and a happy data scientist. If your data scientist just managed to deliver a model end-to-end -end into production, that data scientist becomes extremely valuable in a market where 75% of companies fail to do that. Um, if you depend on your data scientist for um, the operational requirements of your model lifecycle in production and they have to look after that, they will not be happy and they will not be around for long. So you need to look at data ops and um, that scalable delivery pipeline because your data scientists want to solve one problem and then move on to the next problem and not look after that model in production for the rest of their career. There is basically um, delivery technology and retention in data science are all tightly coupled to that long-term success of data science. Um, and that comes straight from me um, and my experience. So credit where credit is due, we all um, stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, Ted Dunning and Alan Friedman, they wrote that inspirational book about machine learning logistics in 2017, which very much changed my career path. Um, and I found my joy in engineering again, um, building that um, architecture and implement it. And you can find the actual book as a free um, ebook on the MapR website. Um, Terry, um, Terry and, and Chris, they've been um, long friends, but also supporters of my efforts. They've been contributing and helping me in my early days of as a data scientist, but also when I started to try to build that rendezvous architecture. And as I said, there are two very long detailed articles on towards data science, which go into the details of um, the um, architecture for production deployment, but also more 
generally on that five different verticals about how to make success of your data science team. And that's been me.